Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Bocock. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, as has been said, I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation, but it's important that you understand this meeting is about you. It's about getting your questions answered. Uh, this is a complex issue that I try to simplify. Um, some say I oversimplify it, but it really is a simple concept to understand. Um, and I, I try to go through that and help you all understand it and how it will impact you as a consumer and as a member of the Kittering community. So um, this presentation that I do have done over a hundred times in virtually uh, almost every state in this country from Ketchikan, Alaska, all the way down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, I've done it here in Maine before, Vermont. Um, Annette and I have worked together uh, in a number of places. She actually came down where we debated this issue in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, that made a community decision, large community, University of Virginia, made a community decision to not go with chloramination, upgraded their treatment plant, and now brag about success that they've had in that, that community. It's a much larger community, but it was a, a great victory. And we've had our wins and we've had our losses. But the one thing that we think is most important for everyone to recognize is the community has a choice. You have a voice and you need to understand your choices so that you can direct your leadership in this community the way you feel you want to go. When I made this presentation, there was a lot of confusion. I wasn't getting a lot of information. So I included all three of the water utilities that I heard thought it was important that they commingled water sources. And the reasoning behind chloramination here in this community was that these community water systems wanted the opportunity to commingle water. And the easiest way to identify with why I thought that, that choices were important to all three of these communities is having the experience of, of, of having these meetings and conducting these meetings around the country is there's probably somebody here from these communities. And I advocate that rather than Kittery dumb down its water supply, why don't York and Kennebunkport improve theirs? If we want to talk about... Oh, <laughs> if we want to talk about commingling water, why should we make our water less so that we can commingle with theirs. So Kittery, York, Kennebunk, Kennebunkport Wells water systems, you guys have choices. Now it's important to understand that no two water qualities are the same. Water quality changes seasonally and water sources are blended in distribution systems. So you have a water source, it changes um, from winter to summer. The use patterns change, your distribution system changes, the age of the water in your drinking water reservoirs change, and that happens not only here in Kittery, but throughout the country. No matter what size the water system is, it's going through constant water quality changes. And so there is always going to be incompatible, incompatibility issues. There are drinking water systems in this country that have groundwater wells on this side of town and a surface water well on this side of the town, and the water shifts between the community day in and day out. You know, back in the, in the day, 35 years ago, when I was a water utility operator, we used to take bets on the, the charts and graphs as far as water use, and we used to watch the water at the Super Bowl flush. And you could actually see it on a graph. <laughs> at halftime, everybody would get up and flush, and you'd see the water use go up. So it's something that you need to understand the dynamics of that distribution system. Not every water system in the United States has the same opportunities to make a choice. I've worked in communities that the water quality is such a challenge that they really are limited in their choices. Or I've worked in communities that really can't afford it. I've worked in parts of, of uh, the Appalachian uh, in Kentucky where the community goes without water for five, six, seven days at a time completely and they, have no, they don't have any ability to make a choice. And so it's, it's very, very difficult, but you have a choice. You already have very good water quality here in Kittery. You already meet all the regulations, and you're confronted with this choice to does our water have to be degraded to match theirs, or do nothing and just continue with chlorination? What does the US EPA really say? At this time, the US EPA believes that the best way to control disinfection byproducts is to both regulate the known byproducts, 
okay, the ones we know about and the ones that we regulate, and to limit the quantities of disinfection byproduct precursors. The process of chloramination is really simple to understand. Chlorine is an oxidizing agent. It is a disinfectant, okay? You can use UV light, you can use ozone, chlorine dioxide, chlorine, chloramine, but it's the oxidation process. When you put chlorine in drinking water, it makes hydrochloric acid and that's what kills bacteria, okay? Ammonia adds nothing to the process. What ammonia does is it acts as a surrogate. It replaces the dirt in the chemical formulation. Okay, a disinfection byproduct is chlorine attacking the organics. The disinfection byproduct precursors are dirt. Okay, people challenge me, oh, how can you say it's dirt? That's so irresponsible. It's decaying leaves and grasses. You look it up in Webster's Dictionary and they call it dirt. <laughs> so you leave, the, you leave the dirt in the water, the chlorine oxidizes it, it forms regulated disinfection byproducts. It forms unregulated but different disinfection byproducts too, but we've decided to regulate nine of them, four trihalomethanes and five halocytic acids. Trihalomethanes and halocytic acids are useful indicators for measuring disinfection byproducts in chlorinated drinking water because they commonly occur at levels that can be easily measured. The biggest problem in water treatment chemistry and understanding regulations is laboratory costs are outrageous. You've all read about or heard about, I'm sure, the PFAS, the perfluorinated carbons that are starting to, you know, firefighting foam, you're starting to see them in the newspaper around the country, okay? One test is costing several thousand dollars. So what they do is they try to find surrogates that if these occur at these levels, we assume that the others are present. And therefore we'll regulate these because we can test for them economically and consider regulating these takes care of those. It's not always the case. The US EPA currently allows chloramine conversion. The way we write regulations in the United States because of the conservative approach to regulation uh, writing is don't force anyone to do anything. Tell them this is the regulation and allow them to come up with creative solutions to get to the end. We advise, we provide best available technologies, but regulators cannot tell a drinking water utility this is what you have to do, this is what you must do, this is the treatment technique that you have to employ. They can highly suggest, but they cannot tell you what to do. So chloramine has been used in this country and you'll hear people talk about for over a hundred years. And in some parts of the country that have naturally occurring ammonia, they understood that, that the chlorine was more persistent because it was bound or sequestered with the ammonia that was naturally occurring and it worked. It allowed the chlorine to last longer in the distribution system so they employed it in places like Denver where the treatment plant would basically treat water of a very low total organic carbon, low precursor, so it's not forming disinfection byproducts, whether it's chlorinated or chloraminated, but it's because they had to get the water hundreds of miles away from the distribution system. And they're feeding it at less than one milligram per liter, very, very low dose. So you can't compare it, and it's a poor excuse. Many utilities use chlorine as their secondary disinfectant. However, in recent years, some of them have changed their secondary disinfectant to chloramines to meet disinfection byproduct regulations. What that means is the ammonia has no beneficial purpose in drinking water. It binds with the chlorine. That process is called sequestration. If I'm attached to the ammonia molecule, I will not attach to the dirt. If I don't attach to the dirt, I don't form regulated disinfection byproducts. It's kind of skirting the intention of the regulation. As the head of the drinking water program at US EPA said, they're not, they're not following the spirit of the regulation, but there's really nothing I can do about it. The US EPA Office of Drinking Water, or the main division of Environmental and Community Health Main Center for Disease Control and Prevention, have never suggested, directed, or required the use of chloramine either as a primary or secondary disinfectant. They say it's a tool in the toolbox. If you want to use it, knock yourselves out. They don't say you have to, they don't say you don't have to. They don't even say one way or the other as to what the health effects might or might not be. Um, US EPA is reevaluating the use of chloramine. It is currently under review, okay? And they're not going to come out and say, you can't use chloramine. 
but they're going to regulate the way you use chloramine and for what purpose you use chloramine. US EPA continues to research drinking water disinfectants and expects to periodically evaluate and possibly update the questions and answers about chloramines when new information becomes available. These are their statements, so I want to make sure I'm very clear that that's what they're putting out. Does this mean Kittery, York, Kennebunkport consumers should be forced to suffer the medical conditions and property damage while we wait for the EPA? The Safe Drinking Water Act was, was uh, written in the early 70s, signed by Ford a few weeks after Nixon left office. Nixon wanted to sign it. Um, five years later, it was promulgated in 1979. That means it became regulation in 1979. We regulate less than 100 chemicals in drinking water today. Less than 100. Um, and and it's, 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 uh, it's not an easy process. I will tell you, everybody's familiar with the hexavalent chromium or chrome-6, that's the Aaron Rakovich chemical. Okay, that was 22 years ago. Every EPA administrator since that movie came out in 2000 has promised us that we would have an MCL for chrome-6 in the, in the United States of America for 22 years. I don't expect one in my lifetime. They're just not going to get around to it, okay? Um, you know, how many people have heard about Flint, Michigan and the drinking water crisis there? Okay. Lead was the biggest concern that was, was being put out there. The lead is what's contaminated this community and poisoned these, these, uh, sick, these kids. Do you know what the maximum contaminant level regulation is for drinking water for lead? Okay. There isn't one. Lead does not have a maximum contaminant level in any state or at the federal level. What the lead regulation is, it says if you test based on a criteria that most people don't understand or even read or follow, if you test what you're considered the most susceptible homes, if you have homes in town that have lead service lines that are over a certain age group, you're required to test those homes on a routine scheduled basis and if they exceed 15 parts per billion for lead, you're required to write a report and promise to take action. That's it. Okay? So even lead is not a regulated drinking water contaminant, per se. It's not on that list. Um, I will tell you that the 14 criminal indictments that came out of the Flint, Michigan case were not about lead. They were about Legionella. Legionella is an airborne disease that comes into your homes and businesses and, and hotels uh, as a water contaminant that if you're exposed to it, brushing your teeth, washing your hands, opening the dishwasher, um, showering is one of the biggest causes, and you inhale it, it causes a pneumonia that oftentimes leads to death. Remember when I told you that there was this conversion process going on with chloramination and how it began with the disinfection byproduct rule. Legionella reported, there's a key word there, reported Legionella cases have increased over 2,000% in the same period of time. 2,000%. So I would argue that you don't need to wait around. The great unknown. The health risks due to disinfection byproducts are not fully known. However, a substantial number of these agents were demonstrated to be toxic in many biological assays. In 1979, the US EPA began the formal regulation of disinfection byproducts. One of those first chemicals that came out in 1979 was chloroform. Chloroform, you remember it? That's what they used to use to knock people out. They put it in the, the rag and knocked you out. Okay. It is the first, it was listed as chloroform at the time before the disinfection byproduct rule. It was, re, it was regulated as an individual contaminant. Um, it's based on studies from the 50s and 60s that says a healthy male who consumes two liters of water every day for 40 years has a one in 10,000 increased chance of getting bladder cancer. I would hate to be that guy, but it hardly rises to the concern level um, of changing a whole you know, distribution system because of that regulation. That's not what I'm concerned about anymore. The regulation was extended in 1998 with the publication of stage one disinfection byproduct rules. The way they roll these regulations out is they start with the big population cities 
and then they crank them down and crank them down. The smaller population cities didn't have to come into compliance until you know, well into the, the 2000s, 2012. So stage one, what stage one did was it said we had to um, meet a certain criteria, the maximum contaminant level for the trihalomethanes and halocytic acid at the treatment plant. Stage two took it out into the distribution system. So the reason for that is, is because chlorine continues to react for days in the distribution system and if you leave those organic precursors in there, out at the, the far reaches of the distribution system, you can have far exceeding levels of trihalomethane and halocytic acids. So they required you to go test, depending on your population and the year and all that, at various points in the distribution system. So that was stage two. So for those of you that have seen the Kittery um, Consumer Confidence Report, they report four locations. Although over 600 disinfection byproducts have been isolated and identified in laboratories, this represents only a fraction of the halogenated organic material that can be isolated after disinfection of raw waters. This is all disinfection byproducts. Somebody looked at this chart earlier today and said, oh, it would be nice if you'd put one out for the chlorinated. This is the chlorinated, the uh, chloraminated, this is all of them. About 70% of them out there we haven't even been able to identify yet in laboratories and been able to even give them names. So the, the, the orange are the trihalomethanes that we were talking about and the, the halocytic acids represent about the 12% and then you can get into all kinds of other crazy chemicals over here. But 70% of them we don't even know about yet. Internationally recognized toxicologists. These are the guys that do the health effects studies of the disinfection byproducts. What happens when people consume these chemicals for long periods of time? What happens when it's in your drinking water? What's the cumulative effect if you get it in your soil, your food, your water, your air? They run all these tests. Research published in 2007, way after 1998, Dr. Michael Plow at University of Illinois indicated that the disinfection byproducts created from the use of chloramine are much more toxic than disinfection byproducts of chlorine. These new nitrogen containing disinfection byproducts are not regulated by the EPA, yet these chemicals are now in drinking water in many United States municipalities. Somebody showed me a chart today of York, who they love to tell you has successfully been on chloramination for a number of years, a couple of decades. You know, They have these chemicals in their drinking water supply. They test for them, they don't report them, they don't talk about them. So the question comes down to, do you want them or do you not? I am not a toxicologist, do not trust me. Maybe don't even talk, trust Dr. Plow. Do your own investigation. But University of Illinois says, you got a problem. Here's the health effects, and I'm, I'm not, I don't wanna cross over what Annette's gonna say too much because she's really in on the medical side, so I'm gonna run over these cursory and then when she speaks, she can get very specific. But I will tell you that the issues associated with chloramination are health effects, immediate, Somebody new you know, gets exposed, they, they ex express uh, skin issues, upper respiratory issues, the like. Chronic, those are the long term. You know, what if you have COPD and things like that? What, what are those effects? And, and then um, uh, long term, you know, those are the cancers. What, what are gonna be the long term toxicological effects? I will tell you that talking to the toxicologists at the University of Illinois and other places around the country, all three health effects are part of the package. Property damage, lead and copper leaching, okay? I don't believe lead and copper leaching is going to be a problem in this community one way or the other. I think that this utility has done a terrific job in understanding corrosion and corrosion protection practices. I think they've deployed them quite possibly, and this is a compliment, a little bit of an overkill for your benefit, okay? So they've done a good job there. Plumbing and rubber gasket damage, there's nothing you can do about that. You will destroy everything in your plumbing systems. And people say, well, you know, what's the cost of this? What's the cost associated with that? Um, not everyone owns all these appliances, but they all have black rubber gaskets in them. Your toilet flapper valve, gone. Okay, those go real fast. You can buy, they'll actually sell a chlorine, a chloramine resistant toilet flapper valve. When you go to the hardware store now, they'll sell the flapper valve and the chlorine resistant flapper valve. It actually says it on the box. So they know it's a problem. I will tell you, I spoke in front of the, the uh, city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and one of the nation's major rubber gasket manufacturers was on the waterboard there. And I actually, one of my slides was his, his uh, uh, factory 
thing about chloramine and what it does to rubber gaskets. And he was like, where'd that come from? And I was like, your own website, buddy. So um, that was funny. And I don't mind saying that because he knows he did it and, and it's out there. Uh, rubber gaskets are a problem. Washerless faucets, I mean, there's black O-rings in places you don't know there's black O-rings. Okay, and they're in your faucets, they're in, in your dishwashers. Think about that little black thing in the bottom of your dishwasher when that blows out. Um, the appliance companies love this. They don't last as long. Um, the, there's in your laundry machine that washes your clothes. Um, the, the rubber O-rings in the, the ice maker in your refrigerator. Think of all the things in your house that come in contact with this water. Now one of the most famous quotes from the chloramine people is, but it's, it's less reactive, meaning it's not killing as many bugs, but more persistent, means it lasts a long time. Okay? Now they will tell you that what happens is, is because it lasts a long time, it gets on the skin of a black rubber gasket and it eats into it, makes it gelatinous. That's the destruction process. Okay? So is my skin. Okay? Those are the same people that will deny that there's any health effects. But look how it literally gets on, embeds, you know, wash it off. What, with chloraminated water? Um, so your appliances. People completely look past appliances. I will tell you the, the process, and then in some parts of the country, we'll talk about chlorine burns later, um, your water heaters are just designed to be trashed. I mean, because of this. Uh, distribution system fouling, nitrification, biofouling, scaling, bacteriological outbreaks. Remember that Legionella thing I was talking about? Those are the bacteriological outbreaks. Okay, what happens, and there's a slide coming up that I'll show you, but so, so just remember that and we'll, we'll talk about it when it comes up. System burnouts and environmental damage. Now, I put this together because I try to keep it in the kind of the big five here. System burnouts is a problem that's just starting to evolve because people are just starting to damage their systems and it's come full circle. And there are drinking water systems around the country both in cold climates and in warm climates and some people say, oh, it's regional, we don't have it here because it's too cold. And, and, and that's, it's, it's true, it's temperature you know, dependent. In Florida, they do a free chlorine burn routinely um, in Texas and, and Missouri and all the way up to um, certain other parts of the country, they, they actually schedule them. They, they literally start them um, right after the 4th of July weekend and they run them all the way to uh, the end of August. And the reason that they do them is because they're switching from chloramine to free chlorine to burn out the biofilm in the, distribution, in the pipes, in your distribution system. Now I've always been fascinated by this concept of a burnout, and that's technically the term that they use at the EPA and everywhere else. The American Water Works Association has actually wrote a manual describing the chlorine burnout process. Um, when they're burning out the biofilm, where does it go? Your ice machine, your dishwasher, your hot water heater fills up with sludge, all those places. So that's system burnouts. Now environmental damage. Um, a lot of water utilities when they go through a change in water or even, even routine. So here, this is a chlorinated system. Um, it requires flushing. Normal debris builds up in the pipes, okay? Especially if you're not removing all of the TOC. That TOC, the total organic carbon, whether it's oxidized or not, falls out. It's sediment in the, in the bottoms of your pipe. And so what'll happen is, is they'll go around the distribution system and they open up fire hydrants and they blow out the stuff in the pipes. That's a, a fairly common practice, but if you start reducing TOC and you start running your distribution system better, that can be avoided. Environmental damage talks about either a flushing process where they're not dechlorinating or dechloraminating, and in, in some pretty spectacular ecosystems, um, Monterey, California killed a whole creek, okay, because somebody broke a fire hydrant off. Uh, they hit it with a car, <laughs> fire hydrant broke off, chloraminated water went down the creek, total fish kill. So you can have problems associated with this. That's the environmental damage. So I group those two together. They're kind of the same, only because when you're burning out the system, you're blowing that snot right into the storm drains, the storm drains go right to the channels, you have ecological problems. The next thing is weaker disinfection loss system security. I have a letter from a full bird colonel at Edwards Air Force Base. You know where they land the space shuttle? It says, you're not putting chloramine on my base. What if there's a sabotage? Somebody injects some sort of, of uh, biological agent in the water supply coming on my base. I have it on DOD letterhead. 
Um, weaker disinfectant, what's it going to do to that biological? I will tell you there are DOD manuals on weaker disinfectant being used in distribution systems and lost system security. There are manuals put out by the American Water Works Association to deal with it. So it's a real issue. Health effects. These are what I'm, uh, Annette's probably going to go over, but these are things that are reported to, to me. Um, one of the things that I find the most frustrating, I am not a medical doctor. I am never going to profess to be a medical doctor or anything close to it, but I go to a doctor. And I've been to several doctors. And I've put out a national challenge, and I'm putting that challenge out here again tonight. Your consumer confidence report at the end of it, if it's written properly according to EPA language, says if you have any questions about your drinking water supply, any additional questions, please contact your medical doctor. Find me a medical doctor in the United States of America that has ever read a consumer confidence report and knows what it says, and you win the prize. <laughs> because not one of them has been able to explain to me how this actually works, okay? And so I, I physically was at a doctor recently um, just for a, a, an annual checkup and I said, hey doc, you know, they, they always tell us we gotta come see you. And he said, no, he says, we don't know anything about this and, and what are these things and how do they affect you? And, and you start explaining it to medical doctors and they go, well, absolutely that would cause a problem. They've just never been even, this has never even been talked about in 2019. So what's, what I believe, I believe consumers. You can't make this up. Some people aren't even aware that the chlorine, chloramine change has taken place and they start reporting health effects. Hey, I noticed that change. I will tell you during a chlorine burn, the, the numbers go off the charts. This is a new phenomenon. Aaron and I have been working together since 1996. It was a rough road from 1996 to 2006, but we got through it. In 2006, that's about the time social media started to happen. We were kind of figuring out, you know, what is this Facebook thing, and it was something else then, and what, what does it mean? Now that we're on social media, and it's only been 10 years, we get over 500 reports in the United States of America every day from somebody saying, Look at my kid's back, I put them in the shower. Look at this red water in my sink. How am I supposed to bathe my children in this? That's how we respond. Literally over 500 a day just in that social media channel alone. I trust consumers. And these are all the health effects from skin rashes, scaly skin, oozing skin, swollen ears. I mean, all these things. Consumers report them. If they were reporting them to a medical doctor, that medical doctor would take them seriously. Medical doctors are who we're pointed to in our consumer confidence report by the CDC and the EPA. But the water treatment professionals ignore the consumers. Actually, they go out and try to discredit the consumer. Next slide. Property damage. Brass fixtures and fittings, faucets. Um, if it, even a lead-free faucet has lead in it, okay? Um, one of the biggest culprits is, have you ever seen a water meter? That nice brass thing? Uh, you guys, I actually saw them handing them out at the water company today. So I think you go pick up your own and install it. I'm not sure how that works in the East Coast. But a brass water meter is one of the places where most lead leaching occurs. So a brass water meter sits full of water all night long. And the reason that lead and copper sampling is done in what they call first flush, they're not allowed to run any water, they're not allowed to flush the pipe. You literally, in order to collect a proper lead sample, you go to the tap, and you take the first flush, that first quantity of water. Because if you let that go by, all that water that's been in the pipes, all that water that was in the meter, all that water that was in your faucet is gone. Well, that's where the lead's at. The lead's not out in the street. It's not in the community drinking water system. It's in your fixtures overnight. So any coffee drinkers in the room, it's the guy making the coffee in the morning that gets the lead, <laughs> okay? It's the first flush. I will tell you, 90% of the drinking water utilities in this country go out and flush the pipe before they take the sample. So it doesn't matter because it's not even regulated anyway. Um, bronze fixtures and fittings, water meters, that's why I put it on there, galvanized fixtures, chrome plating fixtures, all suffer additional corrosion with chloramination. R.L. Hudson's the guy from the Tulsa Water Board. <laughs> okay, he actually talks about the damage chloramine will do to his gaskets. Um, Anyway, here's, here's the things, literally these are from American Water Works Association. You know, side-by-side -side tests with chlorine and chloramines cause more material swelling, deeper, denser cracking, faster loss of elasticity. You can't make this up. These are, these are factual statements put out by industry standard folks. 
Distribution system fouling. Nitrification is a microbial process that converts ammonia and similar nitrogen compounds into nitrite and then nitrate. Nitrification can occur in water systems that use chloramine for the residual disinfection. Okay, simple process. You got a pipe, got water in it, you have chlorine in it. It's making hydrochloric acid, kills bugs, it dissipates, it's gone. So chlorine goes away. Okay, does its job, dies. Chloramine, the bacteria is starting to grow, it's starting to get a little stronger, you're starting to get nitrification. Everybody knows that ammonia, NH, NH3N, which is what they're putting in the, I don't know whether they're using liquid or powder or whatever they're using here, but it's ammonia. Uh, they also add phosphate as the corrosion inhibitor. Okay, both are acceptable chemicals, but for those of you that have ever fertilized your garden, it's nitrogen and phosphate. Those numbers on the bag are the nitrogen con content and the, and, the, and the phosphate content. It's crack cocaine for bacteria in your distribution system. Okay, remember I said the ammonia does nothing beneficial. When the chlorine attacks the biofilm in your pipes, it dies and the ammonia breaks free. The bacteria are going, hey, hey, it's a party, here comes some ammonia. That's this process. And you can't maintain a chlorine residual, so the bacteria grow stronger. Another phenomena that is occurring in this country, how many people here have heard or believe, once again, we're not doctors, so this is gonna just be non-doctor talk, okay? But have you heard about um, bacteriological resistant or uh, um, yes. infections that are uh, uh, resistant to antibiotics? Antibiotic resistant infections. You heard about those? Okay. Using chloramine in this country the way we've been using it, the way we've been using it, I have to make sure I put that in quotes, the way we've been using it has actually started to produce disinfectant residual biofilm. Okay, so what's happened is the bacteria have learned, okay, they're gonna do a chlorine burn around the 4th of July. Let's go on vacation. And so what they do is the smart ones, these Legionella, these microcystins, or these micro, um, non-tuberculous microbacterium, these guys, they go into the biofilm and hang out until the chlorine burns over. And when they do that, they get stronger. And these strains are getting stronger. And Legionella outbreaks are up 2,000%. You're starting to see a pattern here? The problem is greatest when the temperatures are warm and the water usage is low. Okay? Summertime. <coughs> Distribution system fouling. This is what the insides of your pipes look like. That's that bed of, of, of uh, scale. Um, corrosion can be chemical. Okay, acid eating at pipes. You understand how acid would pit something. Um, it can be galvanic, okay, or electric. Okay, you know where you've, you've seen electrodes where an electrode goes into water and it's sacrificial and you, you put an electric charge to it? That's galvanic corrosion or dissimilar metals. When you hook up a, a brass fitting to a galvanized fitting and it corrodes through, okay, that's the, the electrons from the brass are trying to go to the galvanized and the galvanized are trying to get, so you get this galvanic corrosion. The third's bacteriological, okay? Bacteria eat stuff in the water, ammonia, okay? They excrete stuff that causes corrosion. And then they die and create scale, okay? So those are the three processes. And then if I'm a new opportunistic bacteria, I use the scale to hide out in. Sort of like your hermit crabs out on the beach. That's what's occurring. So that's scale up there. Corrosion, that's the chemical process. You have the, the surface reduction. You have all this biological activity going on here. You have detachment, particles, all this heterotropes, coliforms. That's what it looks like. And that's the bioreactor. E. coli, deadly. Legionella, deadly. Nigeria fowler. Now this is a little critter He's not a bacteria, he's, well, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, an amoeba. And he's the one that's, that's predominantly in the south, so it's not a real issue here. Um, but he's learned to adapt and survive. And, and it's the one that you have to, have to inhale, and it, it, it's called the brain-eating amoeba. Uh, it's a very painful death. You literally, it, it eats your brain. Chlorine burnouts. Turn off the ammonia, turn up the chlorine, open the fire hydrants, and burn it out. Now, I hope you would never have to do that here. 
but I will tell you, people that thought they would never have to do it are doing it. They're doing it on a scheduled and a routine basis. And some are taking their chlorine up as high as eight, nine, 10 milligrams per liter. Okay, a swimming pool chlorine test kit ends at three. Chlorine burns in pregnancy and infants. This is where I get scared, okay? And for the benefit of those, here's the scientific studies. They come out of Australia, Canada, Taiwan, British. Um, they come out from all over the world because we don't want to study it here. Um, but what's, what they're finding out, I, I take that back. Kaiser Permanente, an HMO. I don't know if you guys have Kaiser in Maine, but Kaiser is pretty much around the country. It's a major uh, health management organization. Um, they actually did a study on pregnant women and have, have basically understood all of this to be true. The scary part about that is, remember the MCL is 80? They're saying that it needs to be, it, that basically they're seeing effects at 60, okay? So, so these health effect studies, I am not worried about that 85 year old male with a one in 10,000 increased chance of getting bladder cancer, okay? Chloramine and chlorine burns run in these 80 day periods between the two. You only have to test every 90 days. So you take your test and you pass. You burn out the chlorine into the system. And then you turn the ammonia back on. You take your test and you pass. If you took the test in the middle of that period, you would flunk out fast. But you never test then. You only have to test once a quarter. How long is a pregnancy trimester? <coughs> 90 days? Okay. What these studies will tell you, and I'm not gonna go into all of them, but what these studies will tell you is pregnant women in the first trimester, spontaneous abortions up incredible percentage. Second and third, low birth weights, preemies. Okay, um, working with Tyler, Texas, we actually created the term, the September baby. Turn it off on the 4th of July, run it through that trimester, turn it back on at the end of August, take your test, everything was okay, except for the preemies at the hospital in September were on a marked increase. When would happen? Burn out of the environment. Here's the fish kill I was talking about. Where does the sediment, the biofilm, the debris, and the high levels of chlorine go? They open up that fire hydrant. Now, I'm assuming, I have, uh, I'm gonna say that they're dechlorinating and that they would dechloraminate but the, the, the biofilm and the sludge and the sediment and the debris and all that, phew, right into the rivers and streams. Um, this is where you're at. Here's the, the uh, for York and, and Kittery, here's your watershed uh, information right there. So you can go to that if you'd like. Chloramine, oh, loss system security. Chloramine will not react with biological intrusion into a system um, like chlorine. If there's an accidental backflow, backflows are, you probably have, a, I know you do, because it's the law, all those backflow prevention devices. Trust me, I, I served on the board of, of the Foundation for Cross Connection Control and Hydraulic Research. Um, the, the issues of backflow would, would be a whole nother night and make you sick to your stomach. But the idea is, is that somebody in a factory down the street their pump overpowers your city water system and they've pumped some god awful stuff into distribution systems. Um, and then the other thing is, is what happens if it happens at a base. That's the EPA manual over there. EPA water security and technical support action plan. Specifically calls out the issue that we were talking about with chloramination. Okay, you have real options. Precursor GAC treatment. Now I wanna remind you, these were written before I came out had an opportunity to discuss things with the management and board over at the water utility. I have new information. I am pleased, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, to tell you that you already have really cool water quality, so why mess with it? I mean, there's no nice way to say it. That's just exactly how I feel. But you can make it better, okay? And what that is is you can take your precursors out so that you don't have the sludge and sediment buildup in the pipes, you can, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. You're already doing a very successful job at TOC reduction. If you chose to, you could do TOC removal, okay? And there are 50 ways that you can do it. There's post trihalomethane and halocytic GAC treatment, okay? So what precursor is, is you put it at the water treatment plant as it's leaving the water treatment plant and you take out the organics. Science, I will tell you, this came out of Phoenix, Scottsdale, Glendale. All of the major utilities in Arizona got together and they said, we're not chloraminating, ain't gonna happen. So they all got together, they pooled their resources, they pooled their money, they built their own custom reactivation facility in the Arizona marketplace in, in outside of Phoenix. And they found out that if you 
chlorinate and form trihalomethanes and halocytic acids and then run them through the carbon, that the carbon will pull them out and the carbon life was lasting another 40% longer. So they were finding out that if you actually oxidize them, you make them smaller. If they're smaller, you can put more on the carbon so it lasts longer. This is because scientists are actually researching and finding new ways to use carbon. Everyone likes to say carbon's too expensive, carbon's messy. I heard today you need to use ozone with carbon, which is the furthest thing from the truth. Um, and people act like carbon's one product. There are over 600 different types of carbon in water treatment today. It can come from harvest coconut shells, wood, lignite, bituminous coal. It can come from a myriad of products. It can be made in various shapes, sizes. It can be pulverized, reagglomerated. There are so many different ways you can use carbon. And then you have to engineer the solution. How big's the bed? How deep's the bed? What's the flow rate through the bed? What's the head loss across the bed? Engineers are an important part of this process. I will tell you that in, in when carbon first was introduced into the water utility marketplace in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, it was probably $4 a pound. But it's not unlike a Tesla. When you make 400 of them, they're going to cost $100,000. When you make 400,000 of them, they get back into the price range of $50,000. It's the same thing with carbon. Nobody was using it. The only thing carbon was used for back then was for gas masks for the army and for those cigarette filters. Okay? They found out it was a great water treatment chemical for removing organics from the drinking water. And guess what? It's dropped to about a buck a pound from $4 a pound in 1979. So you throw that on an inflation curve and it's not that expensive. It's not messy. It doesn't have a whole lot. All the problems I hear are, are kind of ridiculous. Distribution system chlorine boosters. Oh, those are too expensive. They're too hard to use. They're actually extremely inexpensive and are installed all over the country safely. Nobody uses gas chlorine anymore, not even the treatment plant here. You still you buy bleach now, you know. Calcium um, hypochlorite comes in a truck. It's cheap. It's innocuous. It's what people use to treat swimming pools. We don't use gas chlorine at treatment plants anymore. It's too dangerous. So you put a little fiberglass tank out at your booster station and you drop chlorine in and you keep everything at one. You never, what they do now is they turn out all the water at like 1.8 milligrams per liter, which is low. I mean, I, trust me, your guys' water quality here is really cool. So I know utilities that they'll put it out of the water treatment plant at five so that it makes it to the other side of town at three. Okay, so you don't want to do that. You guys don't have that problem here. And it's miraculous because you have a large distribution system. It's, a, it's, it's very large in scale. Um, and you have a huge water age, but yet your chlorine residual is still lasting, which means you're doing a really good job. Distribution system maintenance. Everybody can do a better job in maintaining their distribution system. That's not a criticism, that's just a fact. Whether you're you know, a big fancy city um, or you're a small rural water utility, everybody can improve their distribution system maintenance. Next slide. This is what a GAC filter bed looks like, okay? Your filter is a little different. It doesn't have all these walls and cells. You have an old, I always like to call, it's, this isn't a criticism, it's just a fact. I've actually operated a similar treatment plant to yours. They're old in Philco Degramont. One giant filter with 110 cells and it continuously backwashes. It's kind of cool. They've been outlawed in California, but I actually argued and got an extension on the, the permitting and use of them. They're fully functioning. They're great little systems. But what most filters look like, your 110 cells or your giant filter is you have an underdrain. Sometimes you have some gravel in here. Then you have sand and then you have um, a, a, a coal media. Okay, right now you're using anthracite. Anthracite's just hard black charcoal like you see in a fish tank uh, that you'd buy at, at Walmart. Okay, it does nothing. So a grain of anthracite, it's mechanical. Stuff filters out on the top, builds up, you get head loss, you backwash it into a wastewater lagoon. That's a simple, simple mechanical process. You replace that grain with an activated piece of car charcoal. You're, you're still buying the same charcoal, you're just activating it now. And it has the same surface area, one handful of it. If you unfolded it chemically, you know, if you're able to take slices of it, would have the equivalent surface area of a football field. Because it, they burn holes in it that suck in or adsorb the organic material. So what happens is the way that they always like to beat up on Bob is they say, hey, in order to do granular activated carbon here, you need to do a pump and this filter system and this and that and this and that. 
So they basically, they designed this Cadillac system from the ground up. And I'm saying, no, you just have to change your filter media. You know, and, and, and it literally becomes insignificant. I understand here in this community that about 40% of the water goes to the base anyway. They pay the, they, they do most of the heavy lifting financially. You guys would never even see this if you just, if you decided as a community that you wanted better than really good. That's really what we're talking about here tonight. These are what they call the post contactors. These are the ones where they actually try to say, uh, you gotta use these um, and, and um, those filters won't work. So this is somebody that doesn't have a regular filtration plant like you have. So that's what I'm saying, you actually have a better choice. All you gotta do is change your media. If your media change out's not accessible, like the, your filter beds won't change it, they don't have the right head, um, you can't make it work, then you do post contactors. This is what's already in Kennebunk for the PFAS they detected there, okay? So carbon's not really that hard to use, it's not expensive, you don't have to use ozone. You put it in this and gosh, it worked. Um, there are thousands of these across the country right now. Custom reactivation. This is something that wasn't allowed five years ago. It is allowed now. Okay? Custom reactivation. Your carbon is spent. I think your carbon's gonna last a really long time because your water quality is so good. So it'll probably time out before it actually loads up because they don't want it to sit in the bed. It'll turn to mush after about four or five years, but so will the anthracite. So you wanna go in and change this stuff out, right? Well, custom reactivation is something new that's brought the economics down even further. What custom re this is the one in Phoenix that I told you they all got together and built. It's on an Indian reservation in Phoenix and they did it there because they could get the permits faster. Um, but that's where they did it. And they bring in the, these white sacks here. They literally <coughs> vacuum it out of your filter. They hoist it on a truck, vacuum out another one, hoist it on a truck, take it to the kiln, reactivate it, and your carbon comes right back. Okay, that's why it's called custom reactivation. The health departments won't allow York to use Kittery's carbon, because it could have Kittery cooties. <laughs> and so you have to take, Kittery's has to come back to Kittery, and York has to go back to York, and there's this whole chain of custody program. And it's because uh, some community water systems could have like uh, uh, PCE, the old the old solvent that was used in, in um, dry cleaners, or TCE from aerospace and stuff like that. A lot of these old contaminants. Um, now mind you, it's completely burned off and gone, but it's, the health department still thinks it's their cooties, so you gotta get your, your own back. Same concept. Air stripping, this is what I've already told you. You guys are doing this, you're doing a bang up job, it's working great, okay? A couple of years ago, you got, you got right up to the 80 on trihalomethanes, they put this in and just knocked the tar out of it. So this is working great. I don't want, I don't know whose it is. Um, I, think, I think you guys are using Solar B here. I, I forget who it was, but hey, I don't care who you're using, it's working great. Converting to chloramine. Now this is a slide that, that I use for communities that are not looking for this compatibility, they're just out there trying to, to, to do it. Um, it's really a temporary fix. They're going to start regulating some of these other components of it. Um, there are additional health effects that we've already talked about you're gonna experience the plumbing and property damage, you're gonna have the bacteriologic outbreaks and, and the, the environmental damage is inevitable. Like I said, this is your meeting, but I think we're gonna to go to Annette. Annette's gonna come up on the screen. Oh, there she is. Um, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I wanna talk briefly about the two communities that were being pushed to use chloramine. One of them, I, you know, Bob said that EPA doesn't tell you what you have to do, you don't have to use chloramine, but we actually got public records in the Rutland, Vermont area where EPA was pushing them to use chloramine. And the other uh, place was Grand Isle, Vermont, where the health department uh, person who had seen what went on with the Champlain Water District advised the water board not to talk about chloramine on the informational meeting before they had their vote. Um, both of those communities were helped out much by Bob Bocock. He came to both of them. He looked at their water plants. Uh, in Rutland, it turns out that they had sand filters and they had not replaced the sand. So they were getting very t high THN and HAA levels. And they started replacing the sand with new sand and it reduced the level so they didn't have to go to chloramine and they still don't have to go to chloramine. We had an active citizens group who... who 
uh, got chloramine on the ballot town meeting, and I think Rutland is one of the few places in the country that's actually voted no to chloramine. In Grand Isle, uh, that was quite a, a soap opera where the citizens group uh, went to the water board meetings and uh, not 90% of the water board resigned. And uh, so the citizens took control of the water board. They had a vote and they have granular activated carbon. Now that, that water system used Lake Champlain water, and so it had all kinds of reasons to go to granular activated carbon. They had pharmaceuticals and fertilizers, pesticides. They now have the uh, best quality water in the state of Vermont. And I'm so grateful to Bob for the assistance that he has provided. And the, the last thing I wanna say before we get to the Q&A is the water system operators are not your enemy. I mean, this is something that these, mostly men, I mean, when we had a public forum in Vermont for all the water system operators, I looked around the room and I, I at, during a break, I said to them, where are the women? And they said she retired last year. So, uh, you know, they, they have their meetings. They're not used to the public coming to their meetings at all. Now, all of a sudden, they've got all you people like breathing down their necks. And um, for them, it's about money and it's about meeting regulations. And the one thing that is absolutely for sure, based on all the work that I've done on this issue, is that adding chloramine to drinking water is not about providing safe, healthy drinking water. It's about meeting regulations and keeping costs down. But it may cost more, but what's the cost of your health? I actually tried to make the meeting a little lighter because they were extremely tense and hostile when we walked into the room. I mean, there's no, there's no other way to say it. Um, I think it was, and, and, and you know, whether you like it or not, I was trying to, you know, just kind of, you know, downplay it. You know, back off. It's, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not here. Aaron and I have never sued a drinking water utility in the United States of America, and we never plan on it. We don't, that's not what we're about. And so I was like, calm down. Let's, let's talk through this. Let's talk about that. And I think by the end of the meeting, we actually um, were able to come to some consensus on some things. And that's why I, I, I'm telling you, right now, you're not going to go to chloramine here until well after August. And they're willing to start providing data and test results. And they're being very, very compliant with the requests. And, and I'm hoping to develop a relationship and a rapport with the superintendent there and be able to actually be additive. I'm not here to be detractive. I'm not here to, to push anything. I'm here just to provide answers and experience, period. So I think it was a good meeting. Now. Um, I'm not going to argue with Jim Malley over at the University of, of New Hampshire, um, but I will tell you that the chloraminated disinfection byproducts are a thousand times more toxic than the chlorinated. They're both toxic. They're both chemicals I don't want in the drinking water. Um, I think that the inhalation impact of the volatiles associated with chlorine are extremely dangerous, more dangerous than the EPA is telling us, but I'm not a toxicologist. When I say that they're, ten, they're a thousand times more toxic, I am quoting from scientists that are far smarter than me, and there are, are a dozen of them out there. So. Can I speak to that too? Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> discussions with people from EPA Region 1. And they all went like, chlorine is bad, that's what they would say, and I'd say, but chloramine is bad. And we were like having two completely different conversations. What, but from a consumer perspective, chlorine is easy to filter out. And for all of you who are using a chlorinated drinking water, you absolutely should be filtering your water. Brita filters work. Um, excuse me, I don't want to post, you know, push any particular brands, but you can get shower filters, you can get uh, filters, you can put chlorinated water out on your counter and 24 hours later the chlorine, chlorine is dissipated. Chlorine, chloraminated water, 30 days, the chloramine is still there. Now, what do you do if you can't use your drinking water in your home when it's chloraminated? 
Then you have to buy a very expensive filter of the same type of carbon that could be in the whole system's filter. But okay, even if you go to a whole house system, we saw people spending anywhere from $2,500 to $10,000 for systems to filter out the chloramine. And so it really is a cost shifting. If every home puts in one of those, what's the cumulative effect of it? And then how do you know when your chloraminated filter isn't working anymore? You start getting sick again. So it really isn't a solution. And the people who did invest in those did find that it, for, for most of them, the symptoms just weren't all gone. And so it really was not a total solution. It makes more sense economically to put it at the, the water treatment plant rather than shifting those filtration costs. But I do want to stress, there, there are plenty of reasons to filter your own chlorinated water too, and it's nowhere near as expensive. Is it possible to switch between chloraminated and, and chlorinated water? Hun I, I, I don't know the number, but I'll tell you it's over a thousand community drinking water systems are already doing the chlorine burn process. Okay, so that's a remedial activity. It's, it's like, the, it's like the, the series of unintended consequences. Um, I hate using that as an example because it's like, it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. But I will tell you that um, the area that I'm from, and I could tell you other areas around the country by way of example, um, but I'll tell you the area that I'm from, um, we switch from chloraminated water to chlorinated water um, in daily cycles based on demand. Okay, so most of the systems have chlorinated groundwater, okay, and then there are surface water that are supplemental supplies, okay, and so what happens is, is the, 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 the surface water comes in, like your surface water treatment plant here, comes in, treated, they're chloraminating it to sequester the chemical reactions to form the regulated disinfected byproducts, and then the wells kick on based on demand, and as the wells kick on, chlorinated water goes like this in the distribution system, and then as the demand decreases, chloraminated water all day long, okay? That being said, there are systems that switch. The city of Los Angeles has one surface water treatment plant. That treatment plant treats Sierra Nevada snow melt with virtually no organics into it, to Sacramento Delta water, which is Stockton's toilet, okay, to Colorado River water, that has completely different chemistry because it's, it's just, you know, all those salt river valleys, you know, it's high in TDS but low in organics. So it has all these water qualities just in the city of Los Angeles. And then they have groundwater wells in the San Fernando Valley and in the, in the uh, South Bay. So can you imagine the water quality shifts that occur there? They're not having problems with it. And what pH do they keep the water system at? It's, they're all different. You know, and that's one of the things that I want to find out through this study that's being planned in August is, is I don't think the disinfectant has much of, a, of a, an impact. I want to know all the other water chemistry questions. You know, what other things in the water in York are going to impact that change? pH is one of them, okay? The lower the pH, remember I told you the chlorine forms hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid is what does the work. Okay, it's not the chlorine. The ammonia does nothing. When, as, as Annette was saying, the, the, you put a pitcher of water out and the chlorine off gases, the ammonia stays. I have a, a couple of questions. Now, my case is probably different than most anybody else that I do home hemodialysis. One millionth of a chlorinated water gets through there, it will ruin my dialysis. And I'll be wind up, if I use that, I can kill me. I have poor thickening because of asbestos. So I have the beginning stages of COPD. I don't need any more respiratory problems. Right. And I also have systemic lupus. So that if I drink the water, my immune system will not take it out. Can I hold the water company accountable for that? I asked them when they had the other meeting, and they skirted the answer. I said, you're gonna pay for the filters and everything I wanna put in? They wouldn't answer me. I'll answer you. Um, he wants to know if, if with basically he's on kidney dialysis at home, 
He has, because of asbestos, COPD issues. He has lupus. There are all the things that we're concerned about from a health effects perspective. He's got them in spades, okay? So the, the question here is, can he hold the water utility accountable for what they're doing? I'm gonna give you the straight answer, no. And the reason is, is because the water meets or ex exceeds all federal and state safe drinking water act requirements, okay? Do they have to notify when they switch back and forth? Yes, that is one thing that EPA, federal, federally mandates that the states enforce. In your opinion, from your experience in other communities, and also with having met with our people here today, um, what do you think is the best approach for us to, to succeed in not having this happen? My answer to your question is, is you've got to stay active. You've got to stay on top of this. You've got to make sure that your community leaders know how you feel. And you can't let it go, okay? Um, Annette actually drove down to, to uh, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia when we made the presentation there. The morning after, that's the University of Virginia's you know, hometown. You know, they had other problems there recently, but that's, okay, that's Charlottesville, Virginia. The morning after the headline in the newspaper read, in an educated community such as Charlotte, there is no place for chloramine. Yep. And they voted it down. Remember the headline? Yeah. And so, um, if you stick with it, you'll win. The community, you know, you've heard uh, Annette's examples. You have to stick with it. If you turn your back for one second, you're going to have chloramine and you'll never get it out. I am a longtime career biology teacher huh. in this community. I'm, I'm very interested if anybody knows what is the residual life of these, of the chlorine byproducts in the environment. I like chlorine because it dissipates. If you leave it for 24 hours, it has dissipated. It's not a friendly chemical, but it does go away. We are infamous for putting things in the environment that do not go away. Whether we're talking about plastics, any, any of those products. We have all kinds of PCBs, we have lead, we have arsenic. We're really good at making it and putting it out there, and we cannot figure out how the heck to get it out. What is the residual life of this stuff in the environment? And it's not lost on me that drinking water is not just consumed by drinking. Any water that goes down my tap goes into my dry well, or goes into my leach field, or goes into my pond. If I water my lawn, it is it gonna kill all the invertebrates yes. in my lawn? Is it gonna kill every worm that is in my lawn that the gentleman who's on dialysis is a lot more important than the worms in my lawn, but I'm very concerned of putting that kind of stuff in our environment, we can't get it back out. Does anybody know what's the half-life of that stuff? 30 days. And um, we, we had people talk about how their tomato plants died, that, uh, you know, a mother-daughter lived in different, dis one chloraminated waters, tomato plant died, the other one didn't. Um, when we had our little forum with the EPA and CDC and we got together all these people who were uh, having health effects, one of the things that they, they talked amongst each other with afterwards was how many of their cats had been sick. <coughs> Take their cats to the vet for diarrhea and all sort of gastrointestinal problems. But I think that your point about what we're doing to the environment, I think it's huge. We're basically poisoning our waters all over the country with this chloraminated product that does not dissipate. And it's going out not just intentionally when you flush your toilet, it's also going out in, well, it's going into the wastewater treatment plant. What happens there? We actually wanted to do some testing of the outflow of wastewater treatment plants at the water wastewater treatment plant in Valletta. Does it does it what happens in the wastewater treatment plants? What does it change to? And and so I think it's a huge environmental issue. There was a massive um, release in Vancouver in the Vancouver area and that wiped out a lot of aquatic life and apparently caused the community to choose not to go to chlorine. So just to, just on the environmental side uh, you know, you should be trying to get it out of every system in, in, in Maine because of what it's doing to the water quality. At the treatment plant, you have your treatment plant and you have the York treatment plant. Can we go over and get the water with primary disinfection, chlorine only, 
before the ammonia addition? And the answer is yes. Same question as yours. It would cost you, you'd have to go and pipe it, and I don't know the physical constraints to piping it, but I understand your question. This gentleman asked the exact same question, so the answer is yes. Okay, her question is, based on the quantity of water resource we have available in Kittering, compared to the quantity of water resource available in York, is there a way where the two community water systems can get together and say, hey, why don't you fix your water so that we can supply you more chlorinated water and vice versa? Because, you know, it's coming down to a resource issue. What I heard time and time again today was that the South Main area has developed a, a co-op of, of multiple water agencies, or it's a committee, South uh, Main? Southern Main Regional Water District. Regional Water District. So there's, anyway, they're all kind of getting together trying to do that. Um, I would encourage, with the participation that we've had this evening, to start broadening that. And it can certainly go in that area. I remember a comment that one of the superintendents made uh, either from Pennybunk or uh, York at the last meeting. And it was along the lines of what uh, the last questionnaire uh, just mentioned. They said that within the water industry in the state of Maine, that this was the way, the direction that they were going. So we're fighting not just um, a town next to us. This is going to be what they've already decided at these regional water district meetings that they're going with farms. So it's, it's going to be a, a big battle um, all the way across the state. And of course, Kittery is at the bottom end of it, which maybe is a good thing. Um, that, that we're not on a squeeze play with two other towns that are counting on us. Uh, for water, but my impression is that this is what they've decided within the state. Um, the water mines are the way that they're going, which is, is worrisome. Basically, it was it was a comment with a semi question in there, in that in that she feels that the state of Maine is kind of pushing this consolidation and that they're gonna, everybody's gonna be on chloramine and it's gonna be just the accepted fact. And I'm afraid you're, you're probably very correct. I'm of the opinion that there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconception about how to treat total organic carbon and how about how to report it and about what the effects of it are. I mean, I clearly heard that um, today in meeting with the water district. Um, th they have a good understanding and a handle on what's going on, but they have a, a general misunderstanding of, of the actual treatment techniques that, that can be deployed. So, you know, it's going to take a tide change. You know, I wish more people from York would participate. I wish more people. It's, is, as you move north of, of Augusta, there's no chloramine. It's literally down here in these concentrated areas. It, if I had a friend that lived in York, I would tell them, you've been on chloramine for a number of years, decades. You know, however long it's been. This is the reason that you've, you've been on it. This is the ramifications associated with it. Would you like to join us in better water quality? Okay, and this is how we can do it together. Okay, you're right. If, if, if the other two systems choose to say no, um, there's not a lot you can do about that. However, I am convinced that with the turnout I've seen here tonight, and I've done this all over the country, you're probably not going to be facing chloramine as a permanent water supply. You may be forced to take it in emergency situations. You can do that. Um, I wouldn't encourage it, but you can do that. I would continue to ask your water utility on your behalf to meet with those secondary sources of supply and encourage them to make their water quality better and safer and with less chemicals. You know, I'm not here telling you you should add more of anything to your water. In fact, I'm telling you you should take what's in there out and if you do, you can use less chemicals. You don't hear that a whole lot in processes today, okay? And so it's a very, very simple process. At a minimum, keep local control and do not allow your system to, con to, to consider adding ammonia in order to get along with your neighbor. Just, just keep going and doing what you're doing. You know, I'm not here to say, oh, they don't know what they're doing and you got a really bad water quality. I'm proud to tell you, your water utility's been doing a good job. They're just buckling to some peer pressure, okay? 
they've, they've got a great water system here and you should be proud of it and you should continue to fight for it. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, I ain't going anywhere. I will answer all of your questions for you. Thank you all very, very much for coming. I'm here until you're, you're done. So, and thank you. Yeah. <laughs>